Uh, but my instinct is that this is a profound change. First of all, I'm sure, at least as sure as one can be, that this will be the most severe global recession, slope, de stroke, depression since the 1930s. It's going to be much worse than previous ones. Second, it was generated within the economy in the sense that it didn't. It, the lead up was not big inflation. There wasn't a need just to squeeze out inflation. Then once, once that had happened, the economy would recover. This time, it's the economy itself has collapsed. Above all, the financial system has collapsed. Now, you can blame the central bank for that to some extent, but it's not in the same way as the very high inflation we saw in the 70s, which preceded the last really bad recession, that of the early 80s, when Paul Volcker eliminated inflation. So it's come from within the system. It's completely global. It's affecting everybody, and it's affecting everybody, as it were, the more, the more open to the world economy they became. The more dependent they became on exports, the more dependent they were on capital inflow, the more hurt they are. So it, it's going to call into question the globalization process in many political systems around the world, which will be a disaster. I mean, it's a very big problem here. And then I think that inevitably people are going to turn on the financial sector, rightly or wrongly, and they will say, look, you created this. We can't have this sort of financial system again. So this era of financial liberalization, at least, I think will be called into question in a very, very big way. So f for all these reasons, I think this is the potential to be a game changer. And politics at the end of this is going to look very different and possibly very much worse. What is China's role going forward do you see in all of this? I mean, in some ways it's damaged, but in some ways it's in the position to make the decisions. It's very unclear because China's situation is both one of strength and very great vulnerability. I mean, the, they've accumulated uh, $2 trillion worth of foreign currency reserves, which are all claims on uh, predominantly uh, at least the U.S. government. And of course, the U.S. government can inflate those away. It can sequester assets if there's a if there's a conflict. It can do all sorts of very strange things. And of course, two trillion worth of dollars. I mean, the, the, as we've seen, the Federal Reserve can, can create that overnight. So it's not a, a very scarce asset in a sense. You could say that the Chinese have devoted an enormous amount of effort of their people to accumulate this treasure, which can be destroyed because it's just a set of paper. Well, it's not only paper, electronic claims. In that sense, they're vul they're vulnerable. On the other hand. They, they do have a large current account surplus, so they can spend more at home if they want and still have a very strong balance of payments position. Doesn't make them vulnerable to capital, uh, need for capital inflow. They don't really need it. So they can, they can respond to this crisis certainly much better than most countries I in the world. And then in addition to this, of course, f their prestige will have been raised at least a bit because there will be the perception that the U.S. model hasn't been working, that the, that the U.S. has not even followed successfully the advice it's given to everybody else in managing financial systems. Uh, they're not dealing with the crisis very successfully. And China, on the other hand, will be seen to have had a much stronger financial system than, ever, than anybody else supposed. Remember, 10 years ago, everybody was talking about the basket case of the Chinese financial system and the robustness of the Western financial system. Obviously, that's completely inverted. So now people will look at China and say, well, that's actually not a bad model. This sort of managed globalization of China, that looks quite effective. And so that's a, a point of strength. So it's points of strength and points of, uh, of weakness. I still remain of the view that in the long run, provided it manages itself reasonably well, the U.S. should come out of this uh, still obviously the dominant power. But uh, the Chinese do have some, some strength, yes. Moving from where we are in globalization to regionalization would be a, a very, very wrenching and difficult change because m m particularly in Asia and, and South America, which is sort of the obvious sort of regions outside uh, the developed world, they ha have been dependent on final demand coming from the developed world. You know, we've seen this now in Asia. When the U.S. demand stopped, and also European demand stopped in the last quarter of last year, this affected the whole of Asia, even those countries that thought they had diversified their exports, say, to China, because China itself was exporting to the United States and Western Europe. So you need a new source of final demand in these regions. That's how it would have to work. And Asia doesn't have a big source of final demand. 
consumption is very weak in Ch China. It's, a, it's less than 40% of GDP. It's very weak in Japan. There's no demand engine there. South America has this problem even to a greater extent. It's a small region. Its the economy isn't large. If it's, if it's going to uh, grow at all, it needs bigger markets. So it's very difficult to go regional. And of course, in addition to that, going regional means reaching a regional agreement. And, uh, uh, and in these regions, that is very, very hard because it, it's not obvious in any of these cases whom to trust, who is the leader. Now, in North America, the U.S. is naturally the leader because it's simply so much bigger than the other two partners. That's simple. In Europe, there's a very special history uh, which has generated a very high level of integration after catastrophe. The bigger countries in Europe are roughly equal in size and they sort of have come to learn, I hope they will continue to, that they have to stick together. So that's given Europe some impulse and that's supported a genuine regional movement in Central and Eastern Europe to join Western Europe and become part of the wider Europe. But in Asia, who's the leader? China or Japan, well, they're going to squabble over that for at least the next 10 years. Maybe in the long run it will be China, but China's a long way from, from being that leader and it doesn't give them the final demand. There is, Brazil has never been accepted as the leader in, uh, in South America, and yet it's the obvious country, but it's, of course, linguistically different from the others. So I tend to think, unfortunately, that if we have a breakdown of the global system, we don't go regional, we go national. And in Europe, maybe the region survives because we are really sort of together and it's a relatively stable rich region with a very well entrenched institutions at least I hope it does but in Asia I fear that it, it would break down now some countries will sort of become in this situation I think sort of satellites of China probably you know, there are countries you can see which would really go into the Chinese orbit but I don't see a a neat regional solution emerging. India wouldn't fit into such a, a solution. Japan and China would still, I think, find it difficult to cooperate. So I think it would be much, much messier than that. And that's what we found in the 30s when the global system broke. It, it broke down nationally. It didn't break down um, regionally.